I always teach that uh, the story of your life is written into the tissues of your body. And so the practice of Om allows you to lift all of those stories, all of those, the ink from all of those pages, and gaze at it. And it gives you the opportunity to either rewrite or erase those experiences, to move through them so that they're now denatured. And in essence, you're scorching, in the terms that yoga would use, scorching the seeds of those impressions so that they no longer impact your actions or uh, dictate how you see the world. And in the um, Munduka, Mandaka Upanishad, it states that um, Om is the bow, the, uh, the individual soul is the arrow, and the absolute is the target. And it's through Om that we're able to achieve an experience of the absolute. Now, in essence, it's beautiful, very poetic. But what does that mean pragmatically to a practitioner, to a, a yogi or yogini, or um, somebody who actually wants to embody this experience of Om? What does that mean? And in order to really understand that, we have to understand what sound is and how it affects us physically and energetically and how we make sound. The sound we're making, the sound I'm making, stops at your tympanic membrane. So the truth of the sound that I'm expressing from my body into space ends at the barrier of your tympanic membrane. So the truth of the experience ends where your eardrum begins. And then that information is translated in your inner ear, in your brain, into an electric signal that is then again translated in the center of your primary auditory cortex into words. Now mantra sort of goes around that, uh, that auditory cortex. Ohm specifically has a really interesting effect on that primary auditory cortex. If I say the word one, for instance, that has a specific meaning to anyone who hears it. A number, um, an amount, it can have any number of meanings. But when you say OM or you chant OM, there's a very real physiological and cognitive process that occurs. In fact, OM in and of itself causes the nerves associated with that primary auditory cortex to calm down. It dampens the stimulus of that auditory cortex. So I'm actually not, as I'm chanting OM, I'm actually not thinking about what it means. As opposed to, let's say, if I was chanting one, or the, the phoneme s, my mind would be thinking, what does one mean? What does one mean? One means this to me, or sounds like a snake, or anything like that. As I'm chanting OM, that calms down. Instead of my brain trying to figure out what that means, it actually shuts down the, or calms down the stimulus across the primary auditory cortex. And also, instead of uh, trying to create an association between the surface of my brain, the cortex of my brain, it brings that stimulus deeper into the in, inner structures of the brain. And those structures we're talking about are things like the, th the thalamus, the hypothalamus, uh, the hippocampus, and the amygdaloid bodies. So by chanting OM, we in essence uh, can calm the mind and the body and instead of thinking about what's going on, it actually takes us into the deeper brain structures of experience. Now, this is where OM becomes really powerful because there's two ways of experiencing the world right now. There's an external way, which is known as exteroception. So I'm externally experiencing the light from the, from, or the, the, the light from the light. I'm also experiencing speaking into the camera. I'm experiencing the sensations of the clothes on my body and I'm speaking. So I'm having to think a lot or process a lot of information along the cortex of my brain, the external structure of my brain. However, if I feel, if I'm feeling what's going on inside, that takes my awareness internally. This is called internal perception or interoception. It's also associated with prachahar in yoga. Om 
takes us from that externalized exteroception and brings us inward. It's a vehicle for bringing us and in, involuting our awareness inward into that internal perception. So that is the, that's the physical, if you will, um, action of taking us from the surface of the brain and bringing us deeper into those, those deep, deep brain stem centers. Now, why is that important with the whole experience of the absolute? What does that have to do with it? Well, the story that we make up about every single experience we've had in our life comes from the cortex or the surface of the brain. That's the story we make up about who cuts us off in traffic, about what happened to us in our childhood. All of those stories that we make up are from association in the neocortex. The truth of the experience, where we find emotional processing and regulation, occur in the deep brain structures. So OM, in essence, takes us, it's a bridge taking us from that externalized story that we made up about the experience into the truth of the experience. Now, how does that assist us in actually gaining a glimpse of or an embodiment of this absolute nature? Well, in yoga, they say that in order to experience the absolute, you have to move through these impressions that make up who you are. In fact, um, I always teach that uh, the story of your life is written into the tissues of your body. And so the practice of Om allows you to lift all of those stories, all of those, the ink from all of those pages and gaze at it. And it gives you the opportunity to either rewrite or erase those experiences, to move through them so that they're now denatured. And in essence, you're scorching, in the terms that yoga would use, scorching the seeds of those impressions so that they no longer impact your actions or... Uh, dictate how you see the world. 